Growing up in the U.S., you learn about the California gold rush, the 49ers and their hunt for gold. But that's only part of the story. The truth is the gold rush was the start of one of the darkest periods in U.S. history. But this dark history remained covered up for years. So what actually happened? There's many lies that were spread about Native Americans through, you know, government propaganda. We were savages, we were Indians, we were basically lesser beings than dogs. The post-gold rush era was the most dangerous time in our history to be a California Indian. Most people did not survive it. Nicole Myers Lim and Jaden Lim are mother and daughter. They are also Pomo women who grew up knowing their family survived violence that was in part spurred on by some of the propaganda that Jaden referred to earlier. Greed for gold in California was pushed through advertisements, articles, and cartoons like these. You can see here in this drawing a 49er carrying several pistols and a rifle. In this picture, a miner is strapped with a gun and a knife while wielding two mining tools. And the woman next to him She's also armed with a gun and a knife. The subtext in pictures like these wasn't lost on the 49ers. 300,000 people poured into California during the gold rush. A lot of them were heavily armed, which led to dangerous and violent behavior. The interesting part of the research was to learn that so many crimes were hidden in plain sight. Benjamin Madley, a professor at UCLA, conducted research over 10 years to complete his book an American genocide. The U.S. Army played a role in the militia campaigns by arming them. So surplus U.S. Army weapons like guns, pistols, ammunition, sabers, cutlasses, those were given to the state of California by the United States Army. Between 1848 and 1852, white settlers in California spent $6 million on knives and pistols alone. That's about $200 million today. They were well armed for the violence of genocide. Three mines were set up in the first year of the gold rush, the Northern, Central, and Southern gold fields. Large ranches would take hundreds of native men and send them up to the mines. It was very common that native people were treated as disposable during that time. They weren't given food or water. They were just basically just treated treated as disposable workers. Some of the white miners wanted to eliminate competition from Native Americans mining freely. But for others, the period was just an excuse for brutal slaughter. Two settlers, Charles Stone and his business partner, Andrew Kelsey, enslaved Pomo and Wapo people on their cattle ranch in Clear Lake. Kelsey and Stone took 100 Pomo men from our tribe to the gold rush and only three returned. They were also keeping young Pomo women as sex slaves in their home. Um, the native men of the tribe went and murdered Kelsey and Stone, and as a result, the U.S. Cavalry came and massacred our tribe. Today, this attack of retaliation is known as the Bloody Island Massacre. It was often said that Bloody Island was a fishing village, and it was very likely that nobody involved with the event that took place in Stone and Kelsey was actually uh, here. Um, it was just a community, uh, a peaceful community. My great, 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 great grandmother hid under her mother's dead body in order to survive. The other children of the tribe hid in the lake surrounding Bloody Island and used tule reeds as a way to breathe while underwater. A lot of academics and historians and people who recount the events of what happened there always say that the lake ran red with the blood of the native people that live there. They estimate in the mass grave at Bloody Island that there's anywhere between 10 and 800 Pomo people. Um, nobody counted, um, nobody cared to account for the atrocities that took place. What we know for certain is that most of the people killed were women and children. We also know that no one was held accountable and that the atrocity didn't diminish the legacy of Stone or Kelsey. The town of Kelseyville, California, is named in honor of Andrew Kelsey. 
the men who committed these acts were not censured. They, they weren't court-martialed. They weren't kicked out of the army. In fact, all of the men who participated were eventually promoted. Uh, several of them became generals, and one later in life became governor of the state of California. A fact that isn't too surprising when you look at the history of California governors. Governor Burnett was the first governor of California, and in his um, opening speech, his first speech to the citizens of California, he waged a war of extermination on California Indians and discussed in his speech about it being a necessity and being inevitable. That's very much a part of Manifest Destiny. In addition to violence from independent white settlers and militia supported by the army, California's newly established government passed an act that authorized the organization of ranger militias. These volunteer groups were made up of gold miners, settlers, and various ranking members of the U.S. Army. I think it's not an exaggeration to say that California legislators established and then funded a state-sponsored killing machine with the aim of capturing or killing all California Indian people. From 1850 to 1861, just 11 years, they were sent on 24 killing campaigns. And these two dozen operations killed an absolute minimum of 1,340 California Indian people. And that's a really low end estimate. That's a very conservative way of thinking about these numbers. These 24 campaigns cost California more than $1.5 million. That's more than $50 million today. And the US Congress reimbursed the territory almost in full. I think it is pretty shameful that the fact that they can spend so much money on killing native peoples and not spend any money on guaranteeing that our youth have a future. In 1850, California's first government also passed the ironically named Act for the Government and Protection of Indians, which listed 20 restrictions on Native American life. It stripped them of legal rights and protections. One example of this Someone who was just loitering could be arrested, and at worst, enslaved. California Indians couldn't carry a firearm. California Indians couldn't testify against a white person in a court of law. Any Indian child that was found without a guardian could be taken into indenture with a white family until their age of majority. That age of majority was well into their 30s. A big goal of this act was to separate Native Americans during peak reproductive years in order to separate at least one generation of children and adults from their families and culture. Ultimately, you know, the government wanted to kill every last Native American person, which means I shouldn't be here. I should not be have been born. There's a lot of silent graves in California. There's a lot of places that don't have names and stories of people attached to them, where people can't go and say, I'm a survivor of this place. Many of the killings weren't recorded, or they weren't given quantitative numbers. Benjamin Madley shows an example of that in his book here, where the death tolls are described as an entire village except a few children, or something as simple as several. So we know that somewhere between roughly 9,000 and 16,000 people suffered violent deaths at the hands of militiamen, vigilantes, U.S. Army soldiers, and their auxiliaries during these years. But I still think that it's likely that many of these killings were not recorded. The state of California paid bounties, anywhere from 50 cents to $5. And they found the receipts in the 1990s and they totaled over $1.6 million. So if you just put a rough estimate of bounties into that $1.6 million figure, you're seeing you know, easily 300,000 people die during the gold rush itself. So many of these details have remained hidden or ignored. In fact, Holt McDougall, the publisher of the Great School Social Studies textbook, told Insider in a statement that they're currently in the process of reviewing these omissions. They said, coverage of the state-sanctioned violence against Native American communities during the California Gold Rush will be expanded in future editions. 
Despite these dark truths, the 49ers are celebrated today throughout popular culture and the history of California. So why aren't we taught about this? I think we've had a kind of institutionalized amnesia about the genocide of California Indians here in the state. America does not want to acknowledge the atrocities um, and the crimes that they have committed. I see the hurt in my community because of this history and because of the trauma that this country has inflicted upon my people. The last stage of genocide is denial. And as we continue to deny this history and not teach truth and authenticity, we perpetuate that genocide. This has been an episode of Whitewash. If there's another story that you'd like us to cover, please let us know. And if you want to read more about Native Americans in California, then check out our resources below.